Hello and welcome to the Pharmacy Seeds Network YouTube channel. Uh, I just want to make our viewers and listeners aware that we now have a Patreon account and uh, we would love for you to help support us and help us to produce better videos and more content. Also, we'd like to encourage your comments, suggestions, and questions in the comments section below. Um, that said, this video will be the first in a series of videos about firewood, BTUs, heating with wood, thermal mass, um, different types of firewood, different types of starter firewood, uh, how to manage and maintain fires, uh, a, a whole host of uh, fire heating related stuff, uh, both for the farm and for the greenhouse and for your home stove as well. Um, that said, uh, I think we should start out with some basic science for this series uh, so you can understand what uh, what's involved in BTUs, thermal mass, firewood, types of firewood, that sort of thing. Uh, the first thing we'll start with here uh, is I want to discuss what a cord of firewood is. Um, a cord uh, basically is 128 cubic feet of firewood that's measured usually 4 foot by 4 foot by 8 foot. Um, this web page here at the New York State Department of Agricultural and Markets uh, describes how to avoid getting burned when you're buying firewood um, and they talk about all the different uh, pieces that go into that and, uh, and they kind of explain it better. But basically a cord is 128 cubic feet of firewood. Uh, the standard typically is 128 cubic feet of firewood stacked tightly. Uh, so. Um, obviously, there are some air gaps in there. According to their uh, calculations, uh, 128 cubic feet of firewood as a cord usually yields about 85 cubic feet of actual wood uh, due to air space. Um, that said, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at this article uh, so if you're buying firewood, you don't get burned. And as you're using firewood, you have a better understanding of uh, what kind of value you're going to get out of that firewood based on its volume and type. That said, uh, let's move on to the sweeps library for uh, firewood heat value comparison charts. This is an excellent resource online. Uh, I will share links for both of these in the comments section below, of course. Um, I'm sorry, in the uh, description of the video, my bad. Anyway, uh, so there are many different types of firewood. Uh, I'm familiar with most of these. I've burned the majority of these firewoods at some point in my life, but uh, I'm going to focus in on stuff that's available on my farm here specifically uh, close by to me because uh, I'm much more intimately familiar with it. Uh, I grew up in a house where we heated our home with firewood uh, ever since I was a little kid, and uh, I learned how to start, manage, and maintain fires from my father. Um, and uh, it was excellent education, I have to say. Uh, you know, of all the things a person can learn, that's got to be one of the one of the best and most valuable uh, knowledge tools a person could go forward with. Uh, for years after I moved out from my parents, uh, the places I lived in did not have uh, wood wood fired heat. They were oil or propane fired, and it cost me a lot of money and time. And in the, in the last couple of years, I've set up a greenhouse here and a wood stove here. That are both uh, everything's run by firewood, and it saves me a lot of money. And I don't mind the exercise and work; it actually helps me get up and move around in the winter time, and that's something I really appreciate. So that said, let's go into some different types of firewood. Um, apple is one that's commonly available in our area. It's often used for smoking and a bunch of other things, and has a really nice aromatic smell to it. Um, at 21.6 million BTUs to the cord, it's. Uh, it's got quite a bit of heat value. I don't have a lot of that on this farm. The few apple trees I have, uh, I've been saving. Occasionally, I do prune some stuff off of them, but uh, it's not a whole lot. Uh, one of my favorites that we have here on this farm, and we have a lot of it, is white ash. Uh, white ash is 21.6 million BTUs to the cord, and uh, it's one of the only woods that I'm aware of that will burn even when it's green. In fact, in the wintertime when it gets real cold here, if I don't have uh, some good dry seasoned firewood, I often will go out and uh, drop a fresh ash tree and bring back a load of firewood of green ash and split that and go right into the stove. And that produces tremendous heat with, uh, with very little creosote buildup. Uh, I believe that's the only one that is... Uh, uh, defined by, you know, all the uh, different 
agencies who've done research on this sort of stuff in the past as being a, a wood you can burn green. Other than that, your wood should be seasoned. Uh, I suppose I should explain seasoned. When I say your wood should be seasoned, it should be uh, dried for at least six months. It would be split and stacked in a dry location. Dry meaning like covered, protected from rain and snow with air allowed to flow through it and that'll dry it and cure it and then it'll burn better. Uh, if you don't dry it and cure it enough, it'll produce a lot of creosote. It won't burn well and you won't get the heat value out of it because a lot of that heat value will be spent extracting the moisture from the wood and go out the chimney in the form of moisture, in the form of steam, basically. So the idea is to get uh, your firewood fairly dry. Uh, that said, I have seen firewood, I, I, I know some people that get kiln-dried firewood delivered to them, and while it burns really hot and really fast, and that's uh, nice for a fireplace, uh, which is what they use it for, as far as heat value goes, I find it burns a little too fast, and it makes your stoke cycles very short. Uh, one thing you don't want to have to do when it's really cold out is go out and stoke or go in and stoke your fire or go out and get firewood every 10 minutes. So uh, I don't recommend kiln dried firewood for, for that uh, unless you have a super efficient stove where you can dial back the airflow. Uh, in that case, it would work. Anyway, uh, ash is a fantastic one. I use that quite frequently, um, but it's not the only wood that we have here on this farm. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have any of these nice birches here. Uh, birches are fantastic, both for heat production and both for, and also for starting fires. Uh, the typical one in the northeast here is the birch, the white birch, which puts out about 20 million BTUs to the cord. And so uh, it's great for that. It splits fairly easily. It cuts fairly easily. And with the advantage of the, the bark, that white papery bark, burns literally like gasoline. Uh, even if it's been soaking in water, you can pull it out, shake it off, and if you can get it lit, you know, if you can get the water droplets off it and get it lit, it'll burn just like gasoline. So it's a fantastic fire starter if you're trying to get a fire going. Fantastic, uh, naturally available material. Um, cherry, let's see, cherry, black cherry is another one we have a lot of around here. There's a ton of those around here. Um, and I use quite a bit of that. Um, I like it dry. It burns fantastic dry. It splits fantastic dry. Um, I should mention that ash splits fantastic green and dry. It's very easy to split, very easy wood to work with, and it cuts very easily, which is nice. Uh, the cherry, uh, I, I'm going to say this just to explain, but I, I have to say I caution you very strongly or recommend against using green cherry in your wood stove, uh, although I do it in the greenhouse. Um, sometimes I'll take split or large chunks of it and put it in for the overnight stoke, and it takes a little longer for that to, uh, to catch fire, and so consequently you get a nice coal base, and it burns into a nice coal base. It provides a long-term heat source, um, but uh, you know I, I wouldn't recommend using that for your home stove, and if you're not familiar with burning woods, I would steer away from anything green with the exception of white ash. Um, but that said, black cherry, 19.5 million BTUs to the cord. It's a fantastic firewood to have around. We also have a lot of uh, cottonwood or poplar around here. You'll notice that poplar is only 12.6 million BTUs to the cord. Um, I, poplar is a great wood for starting fires. It's good for uh, uh, you know warmer nights where you're not trying to produce a tremendous amount of heat. The downside I find with poplar, usually once it falls around here, it, it's a very weak wood. It tends to snap off of the tree or the whole tree will snap off and fall over. And I find it tends to absorb moisture and develop mycelium and uh, mushrooms and fungi and get pretty punky pretty quick, so I rarely use it. If you're going to get it, I would say go out and cut down live clean trees or trees that have just fallen. Cut it, split it, stack it, keep it dry. If you don't, it will definitely uh, grow all kinds of mushrooms very quickly. Um, another one we have around here uh, is elm. Uh, there are several different types of elm. The one that we have a lot of is the American elm. These trees have a, a, a disease, I forget what the disease is called off the top of my head, um, but a lot of them are dying around here, so there are quite a few standing dead elm that are already cured, seasoned, and dried standing. So I use a lot of those, and uh, they burn very well at 18.4 million BTUs. They produce a pretty good amount of heat and uh, fairly easy to split when it's dry. When it's wet, it can be very difficult to split. Uh, it'll tend to bounce a wall right back out. Even if you get a splitting crack opened up in the top of the wood, sometimes you'll hit it again and the mall will come right back out because there's so much spring force. Um, 
So I would say if you're going to split elm, split it dry. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of the furs. Uh, they don't really make good firewood for stoves. They do work great for outside. Um, some small fir branches, fir, pine, spruce, hemlock, cedar, any of those are a great starter fuel if the branches are dry. If they're wet, they smolder and uh, they're not that great. I would not recommend using them for uh, a regular wood stove. You'll have a tremendous amount of creosote so build up and you could be at risk of a chimney fire. And I don't want to see that to happen to anybody. No one wants to be burned out of their home. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, we got locust here. Uh, there's black and honey locust. Uh, we don't have a lot of the black locust around here. We do have quite a bit of the honey locust, although most of the ones on this particular property are quite large and they're near power lines. So without special equipment, I wouldn't be able to remove them. Uh, but you'll notice that locust is quite a high BTU value at 23.2 million for the black and 23.7 million BTUs for the honey locust. Um, it's a fantastic fuel. I will say cutting locust is very difficult. It's, uh, it's a very hard wood. It'll dull your chainsaw chain or your saw fairly quickly. Um, in fact, with a chainsaw cutting locust, I find a lot of times you'll see sparks coming off of the chain as you're cutting the wood. That's how hard it is. Um, but uh, it splits fairly easily once it's dry, and it is a fantastic uh, heat producer. Um, oftentimes, uh, you'll see recommendations against using locust ex exclusively in a wood stove because it, it actually burns so hot, it'll actually melt the wood stove steel and you'll, you'll get deformation on your stove. So that said, I would mix it with other fuels so that you don't uh, overheat your stove and, and cause you, you know, damage to your own wood stove. Uh, maples, we have a tremendous amount of maples around here. Uh, all different types. Um, the main ones we have here on this farm are sugar maple and silver maple, and we do have some black maple. Uh, the sugar maple at 23.2 million BTUs is fantastic. Uh, I love the sugar maple. It's uh, a little heavier if you look at the weight comparison uh, versus a silver maple, but for its weight, you get a lot more BTUs. Um, I tend to use sugar maple when it's available. Um, I don't go cut them green. They take a long time to cure, and I usually don't go cutting green firewood and letting it cure for a year, although that's a fantastic practice. We just have so much firewood that falls down around here on its own. There's no need for me to go cutting most of the live trees. It might as well use what nature's already provided. Uh, I'll just briefly mention mulberry. Uh, we have quite a few of those here. It's a very hot burning wood. Uh, it can be tough to split. Um, uh, but it's a it's a great fuel if you have a lot of it around. Um, I would highly recommend not cutting all of them down because mulberries actually have a tremendous amount of medicinal value if you eat them or make them into jams or jellies. Uh, so I would say you should probably look into that from a nutritional standpoint also. Don't cut all your mulberry trees down. I know they make a mess on the driveway or in the yard, but uh, if you have a place where you can let one grow, uh, it's a fantastic medicinal plant you can harvest from year after year. Uh, we'll go into oaks real quick. Um, I'm not too familiar with burr, oregon, or post oak. Uh, around here we have red and white. Uh, on this particular farm we have primarily white oak, which you'll notice is 24.2 million BTUs versus the red at 22.1. Oak burns a lot slower than some of these other woods, um, and because of that it's a great overnight fuel and a great uh, you know, coal-based fuel, but I wouldn't use it to like start a fire unless you're really familiar with starting fires and you cut your, you split your kindling very small because uh, it has a very high ignition temperature and so it takes a long time to get it going. That said, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, fuel to have if you do, and I, I do use oak for overnight stokes sometimes to uh, to lengthen the stoke time out. Um, what else is on this list here? Uh, not a whole lot more that we use around here. Um, I, I guess I'll just mention briefly that the pines are great fire starters, as I mentioned before. Um, and I would also say that uh, as far as uh, as far as using them for fuel, I would not use them. Again, I would not use them in a wood stove. They produce a lot of creosote and soot, and you could potentially end up with a uh, chimney fire. Um, if you're using them just to start your fire, that's fine. I wouldn't. I wouldn't burn a lot of either of any of those. One other one that I do use is the Eastern Red Cedar. 
Um, you'll notice that's only 12.1 million BTUs, uh, and I only use this at very specific times, like if I'm starting a fire or if I want uh, if I want to get a lot of heat up very quickly to get another fuel going. Sometimes I'll use cedar. I always use cured Easter, cured and dried eastern red cedar. There's a lot of it that's dead around on this property, and I'll cut it up and bring it up, and I'll split it into small pieces. It's a great way to get a hot fire going early in the morning if you want to you know, make coffee quickly or something like that. I would not use it as a regular fuel, but I did want to mention it because uh, this stuff burns basically like gasoline once it gets burning, and it, so it's a fantastic starter fuel. Um, so that said, I suppose I should go into uh, what a BTU is. Um, well, they state it right here, um, but I'll, I'll explain it a little better for you. Uh, I'll, first, I'll read this to you. Uh, the heat value measurement used in British, uh, the heat value measurement used in the British Thermal Unit, or BTU, which is defined as the amount of thermal energy it takes to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. Um, so you notice these ratings are a million BTUs per cord. So that means for 128 cubic feet of firewood, We'll just pick alder on top, for example, 14.8 million BTUs in 128 cubic feet of that particular fuel. So basically a BTU is the amount of heat energy it takes to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. So if you have a gallon of water, one gallon of water weighs 8.33 pounds, roughly, based on temperature. This is around 60 degrees Celsius. Um, so 8.33 pounds of water or one gallon of water, that means if you wanted to raise one gallon of water from 60 degrees to 61 degrees Fahrenheit, say, that would take you 8.33 BTUs to achieve that. Um, of course, this isn't uh, accounting for efficiency losses or anything like that. That's assuming you can uh, get all the BTUs you're producing into that gallon of water. Um, I'll just mention briefly that in my greenhouse, I use several very large water tanks as thermal masses. My stove is nested in between those, and so the excess heat that my stove is producing is going into those thermal mass tanks, and they are storing that energy. And later on, when the stove goes out, and uh, and I'm still sleeping or you know not able to t to go check on it or, or fuel it, the uh, thermal mass carries the average temperature of the greenhouse and and keeps it from freezing on me so quickly. Um, I'll just real quickly demonstrate a, a chart here. This is a uh, a live chart over the last 24 hours uh, of. Uh, multiple different sensors in my greenhouse. Uh, the big red line on top is the stove temperature. These two red and green lines up top are the one thermal mass that's right on top of the stove. That's a 40 gallon stainless steel uh, stock pot actually filled with water. Um, and you'll notice how long that curve cycle is. The stove gets hot and brings the temperature of that up and then after the stove goes out these are slowly releasing their heat back into the greenhouse. Uh, you'll notice up on the top chart here that I have uh, BTUs in storage calculated based on those thermal masses and you can see again how it's you know it's stored as the stove is running and then released slowly over time to keep the greenhouse temperature nice. This tan line here represents the average greenhouse temperature um, average ab amongst uh, four different sensors. And so you can see how the greenhouse temperature stays fairly steady despite the stove going through some very hot spikes and despite the thermal masses uh, climbing and falling in temperature. So uh, that's the basic concept of BTUs and thermal mass usage. Um, I think we've covered uh, what a quarter of wood is, what BTUs are, and some of the firewood uh, values. And you can see why one why you would pick one firewood over another because it has a higher uh, BTU value or has a different burn rate. So uh, in the next video, we'll get, into, we'll get into some more detail about that and some more of the science about that. In the meantime, I encourage you to ask questions down below in the comments section. And uh, like, subscribe, and uh, if you really want to support us and you want to see more videos like this come out or other types of videos, educational about farming, nutrition, high bricks farming, any of that kind of stuff, by all means, I'll leave our Patreon account link in the bottom here. Uh, please go check out our Patreon account and uh, you know help us out if you like what we're doing. That said, uh, thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seeds Network, and I hope that you'll join us next time.